Section 18 of Japanese Girls and Women. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Japanese Girls and Women by Alice M. Bacon. Domestic Service. To the foreigner, up his arrival in Japan, the status of household servants is at first a source of much perplexity. There is a freedom in their relations with the families that they serve that in this country would be regarded as impudence and an independence of action that in many cases seems to take the form of direct disobedience to orders from the steward of your household who keeps your accounts makes your purchases and manages your affairs to your chin rickshaw man or groom every servant in your establishment does what is right in his own eyes and after the manner that he thinks best mere blind obedience to orders is not regarded as a virtue in a japanese servant he must do his own thinking and if he cannot grasp the reason for your order that order will not be carried out housekeeping in japan is frequently the despair of the thrifty american housewife who has been accustomed in her own country to be the head of every detail of household work leaving to her servants only the mechanical labor of the hands she begins by showing her oriental help the work to be done and just the way in which she is accustomed to having it done at home and the chances are about one in a hundred that the servant will carry out her instructions in the ninety-nine other cases he will accomplish the desired result but by means totally different from those to which the american housekeeper is accustomed if the housewife is one of the worrying kind who cares as much about the way in which the thing is done as about the accomplished result the chances are that she will wear herself out in a fruitless endeavour to make her servants do things in her own way and will when she returns to america assure the japanese servants are the most idle stupid and altogether worthless lot that it was ever her bad fortune to have to do with but on the other hand if the lady of the house is one who is willing to give general orders and then sit down and wait until the work is done before criticizing it she will find that by some means or other the work will be accomplished and her desire will be carried out provided only that her servants see a reason for getting the thing done and as she finds that her domestic will take responsibility upon themselves and will work not only with their hands but with the will and intellect in her service she soon yields to their protecting and thoughtful care for herself and her interests and when she returns to america is loud in her praises of the competence and devotion of her japanese servants even in the treaty ports where contact with foreigners has given to the japanese attendants the silent and repressed air that we regard as the standard manner for a servant they have not resigned the right of private judgment but if faithful and honest seek the best good of their employer even if his best good involves disobedience of his orders this characteristic of the japanese servant is aggravated when he is in the employment of foreigners for the simple reason that he is apt to regard a foreigner as a species of imbecile who must be cared for tenderly because he is quite incompetent to care for himself but whose fancies must not be too much regarded of the relations of foreign employers and japanese servants much might be said but our business is with the position of the servants in a japanese household under the old feudal system the servants of every family were its hereditary retainers and from generation to generation desired no higher lot than personal service in the family to which they belonged the principle of loyalty to the family interests was the leading principle in the lives of the servants just as loyalty to the daimyo was the highest duty of the samurai long and intimate knowledge of the family history and traits of character rendered it possible for the retainer to work intelligently for his master and to do independently for him many things without orders the servant in many cases knew his master and his master's interests as well as the master himself or even better and must act by the light of his own knowledge in cases where his master was ignorant or misinformed one can easily see how ties of good fellowship and sympathy would arise between masters and servants how a community of interest would exist so that the good of the master and his family would be the condition for the good of the servant and his family in america where the relation between servant and employer is usually a simple business arrangement each giving certain specific considerations and nothing more the relation of servant to master is shorn of all sentiment and affection the servant's interests are quite apart from those of his employer and his main object is to get the specified work done and obtain more time for himself 
and sooner or later to leave the despised occupation of domestic service for some higher and more independent calling in japan where faithful service of a master was regarded as a calling worthy of absorbing any one's highest abilities through a lifetime the position of a servant was not menial or degrading but might be higher than that of the farmer merchant or artisan whether the position was a high or low one depended not so much on the work done as the person for whom it was done and the servant of a daimyo or high rank samurai was worthy of more honour and might be of far better birth than the independent merchant or artisan as the former feudal system is yet within the memory of many of the present generation and its feelings still alive in japan much of the old sentiment remains even with the merely higher domestics in the household of the present day the servant by his own master is addressed by name with no title of respect is treated as an inferior and spoken to in the language used toward inferiors but to all others he is a person to be treated with respect to be bowed to profoundly addressed by the title son and spoken to in the politest of language you make a call upon a japanese household and the servant who admits you will expect to exchange the former salutations with you when you are ushered into the reception room should the lady of the house be absent the head servant will not only serve you with tea and refreshments and offer you hospitalities in their mistress's name but may if no one else be there sit with you in the parlour entertaining you with conversation until the return of the hostess the servants of the household are by no means ignored socially the servants of the household are by no means ignored socially as they are with us but are always recognized and saluted by visitors as they pass into and out of the room and are free to join in the conversation of their betters should they see any place where it is possible that they might shed light on the subject discussed but though given his liberty of speech treated with much consideration and having sometimes much responsibility servants do not forget their places in the household and do not seem to be bold or out of place indeed the manners of some of them would seem to any one but a japanese to denote a lack of proper self-respect an excess of humility or an affectation of it in explaining to my scholars who are reading little lord fauntleroy in english a passage where a footman is spoken of as having nearly disgraced himself by loving at some quaint saying of the young lord my little peeresses were amazed beyond measure to learn that in europe and america a servant is suspected never to show any interest in or knowledge of the conversation of his betters never to speak unless addressed and never to smile under any circumstances doubtless in their shrewd little brains they formed their opinion of a civilization imposing such barbarous restraints upon one class of persons the women servants in the family are in position more like the self-respecting old-fashioned new england help than they are like the modern girl they do not work all day while the mistress sits in the parlor doing nothing and then when their day's work is done go out anxious to forget in the society of their friends the drudgery which only the necessity for self-support and the high wages to be earned render tolerable as has been explained in a previous chapter the mistress of the house be she princess or peasant is herself the head-servant and only gives up to her helpers the part of the labour which she has not the time or strength to perform certain menial duties toward her husband and children every japanese wife and mother must do herself and would scorn to delegate to any other woman except in case of absolute necessity thus there is not that gap between mistress and maid that exists in our days among the women of this country the servants work with their mistress helping her in every possible way and are treated as responsible members of the household if not of the family itself at evening when the wooden shutters are slid into their places around the porch and the lamps are lighted the family gather together in the sitting-room around the hibachi to talk free from interruption for no visitor comes at such an hour to disturb the family circle the mother will have a sewing or work the children will study the lessons and the others will talk or amuse themselves in various ways then perhaps the maid-servants having finished the tasks about the house will join the circle always at a respectful distance will do their sewing and listen to the talk and often join in the conversation but in the most humble manner perhaps at times some one more ambitious than the others will bring in a book and ask the meaning of a word or a phrase she has met in studying and little helps of this kind are given most willingly we have seen that ladies-in-waiting in the houses of the nobles are daughters of samurai 
who gladly serve in these positions for the sake of the honor of such service and the training they receive in noble houses in a somewhat similar way places in the homes of those of distinction or skill in any art or profession are held in great demand among the japanese and a prominent poet scholar physician or professional man of any kind is often asked by anxious parents to take the sons under his own roof so that they may be under his influence and receive the benefits of stay in such an honourable house the parents who thus send the children may not be of low rank at all but are usually not sufficiently well to do to spend much money in the education of the children the position that such boys occupy in the household is a curious one they are called chose meaning students and students they usually are spending all their leisure moments and their evenings in study they are never treated as inferiors except in age and experience they may or may not eat with the family and are always addressed with respect on the other hand they always feel themselves to be dependents and must be willing without wages to work in any capacity about the house for the sake of picking up what crumbs of knowledge may fall to them from the master's table service is not absolutely demanded of them but they are expected to do what will pay for the board and do not regard menial work as below them performing cheerfully all that the master may require of them in this way a man of moderate means can help along many poor young men in whom he may feel interested and in return be saved expense about his household work and the students while always considerately treated are able without great expense to study often even to prepare for college or get a start in one of the professions for they have many leisure moments to devote to the books many prominent men of the present day have been students of this class and are now in their turn helping the younger generation the boys that one sees in shops or with workmen of all kinds helping in many little ways are not hirelings but apprentices who hope some day to hold just as good positions as their masters and expect to know as much if not a great deal more at the shop or in the home they not only help in the trades or occupations that they are learning but are willing to do any kind of menial work for their master or his family in return for what they receive from him for they do not pay for their board nor for what they are taught even when the age of education is already past grown men and women are willing to leave quite independent positions to shine with reflected glory as servants of persons of high rank or distinction the servant is not greater than his master in japan but if the master is great the servant is considerably greater than the man without a master in a country like japan where one finds but few wealthy people there may be cause for wonder at the large households where there are so many servants there will be often as many as ten or more servants in a home where in other ways luxury and wealth are not displayed in the oko or the part of the house where the lady of the house stays I found their own maid and women who help in the work about the house so in the leisure moments and are the higher servants of the family they are also the children's attendants often one for each child as well as the waiting women for the go in summer in the kitchen are the cooks and the assistants the lower servants and usually one or more jinriksha men who belong to the house and if this be the home of an official who keeps horses a beto for each animal there are also gardeners errand boys and gatekeepers to guard the large yashikis such retinue would seem a great deal to maintain but servants wages are so low and the cost of living is so small that in this matter japanese can afford to be luxurious three or four dollars will cover the cost of food for a month for one person and women servants expect only a few dollars in wages for that time the men receive much higher pay but at the most it is less than what a good cook receives in many homes here the wages do not include occasional presents especially those given semi-annually a small sum of money or dress material of some kind which servants expect and which of course are no small item in the family expense homes which maintain a great deal of style need many servants for they expect to work less than american servant and are less able to hurry and rush through their work and they do not desire if they could to take life so hard even to earn greater pay the family too in many cases are used to having plenty of hands to do the work the ladies are much less independent and life has more formalities and red tape in japan than in america a great deal of the shopping is done by servants who are sent out on errands and often to important business maids accompany their mistresses to make visits servants go with parties to the theatre to picnics or on journeys and these expeditions are as heartily enjoyed by them as by their masters 
it is expected especially of ladies and persons of high rank that the details of the journey the bargaining with coolies the hiring of vehicles and paying of bills be left in charge of some man-servant who is entirely responsible and who makes all the bargains arranges the journey for his employer and takes charge of everything even to the amount of fees given along the way perhaps the highest position of service now positions honourable anywhere in japan are held by those who remain of the old retainers of daimyos and who regulate the households of the nobles such men must have good education and good judgment for much is left in their hands and they are usually gentlemen who would be known as such anywhere they are the stewards of the household the secretaries of their masters keep all accounts for which they are responsible and attend to the minor affairs of etiquette the latter no trifling duty in a noble's home it is they who accompany the nobles on their journeys regulate advise and attend to the little affairs of life of which the master may be ignorant and cares not to learn they are the last of the crowds of feudal retainers who once filled castle and yashiki and are now scattered throughout the length and breadth of the kingdom the higher servants in the household must be always more or less trained in etiquette and are expected to look neat and tidy to serve guests with tea and refreshments without any orders to that effect and to use the judgment in little household affairs and thus help the lady of the house they are usually clever with their fingers and can sew neatly when their mistress goes out they assist her to dress and only a few words from her will be necessary for them to have everything in readiness from a sash and dress to all the little belongings of a lady's costume many a bright quick servant is found who will understand and guess her mistress's wants without being told each detail and these not only serve their hands but think for their employers much less is expected of the lower servants who belong to the kitchen and have less to do with the family in general and little or no personal contact with their masters they perform their round of duties with little responsibility and are regarded as much lower in the social scale of servants of which we have seen there are many degrees the little goes and taki or rice cook who works all day in the kitchen may be a fat red-cheeked frowsy-haired country girl patient hard-working and humble-minded willing to pother about all day with her kettles and pans and sit up half the night over her own sewing or the study of the often unfamiliar art of reading and writing but entirely unacquainted with the details of etiquette a knowledge of which is a necessity to the higher servants sometimes even thrown into an agony of dividends should it become necessary to appear before master or mistress some of the customs of the household in regard to servants are quite striking to a foreigner when the master of the house starts out each morning besides the wife and children who seem of all the servants who are not especially occupied a goodly number sometimes come to the front door and bow down to bid him good-bye on his return also when the noise of the kuruma is heard and the shout of the man who called out o kairi when near the house the servants go out to greet him and bowing low speak the customary words of salutation to a greater or less degree the same is done to every member of the family the younger members however receiving a smaller share of the attention than the elders when as very often happens a guest staying for any length of time in a family or a frequent visitor gives the servant a present of money or any trifle the servant after thanking the donor takes the white paper bundle to the mistress of the house and shows it to her expressing his gratitude to her for the gift and also asking her to thank the giver this of course is always done for a gift to a servant is as much of a favour to the mistress as a present to a child is to its mother when a servant wishes to leave a family she rarely goes to her mistress and states that she is dissatisfied with her position and that some better chance has been offered her such a natural excuse never occurs to the japanese servant unless he be a jinrikisha man or beto who may not know how to do better for it is a very rude way of leaving service the high-minded maid will proceed very differently a few days leave of absence to visit home will be asked and usually granted for japanese servants never have any settled time to take holiday at the end of the given time the mistress will begin to wonder what has become of the girl who has failed to return and the lady will make up her mind she will not let her go again so readily just when she has a sharp reproof ready a messenger or letter will arrive with some good excuse couched in most polite and humble terms sometimes it will be that she has found herself too weak for service or that work at home or the illness of some member of the family detains her so that she is not able to come back at present the excuse is understood and accepted as final and another servant is sought for and obtained 
after several weeks have passed very likely after entering a new place the old servant will turn up some day express her thanks for all past kindnesses and regrets at not returning in time will take her pay and her bundles and disappear for ever even when servants come on trial for a few days they often go away nominally to fetch their belongings or make arrangements to return but the lady of the house does not know whether the woman is satisfied or not if she is not her refusal is always brought by a third person if the mistress on her side does not wish to hide a girl she will not tell her so to her face but will send word at this time to prevent her coming such is the etiquette in these matters of mistress and maid Note, to the american mind this method of terminating relations is always irritating and frequently embarrassing but in japan any discomfort is to be endured rather than the slightest suspicion of bad manners if the foreign visitor is trying to learn to be a good japanese she must submit patiently when the servant so lamely engaged fails to appear at the appointed hour sending a letter instead to say that she is ill or when the woman upon whom she is depending to travel with her the next day to the country receives a telegram calling her to the bedside of a mythical son and departs bag and baggage at a moment's notice leaving her quondam mistress to shift for herself as best she may End of note. only by a multiplicity of details is it possible to give much idea of the position of servants in a japanese house and even then the result arrived at is that the positions of what we would call domestic servants vary so greatly in honour and responsibility that it is almost impossible to draw any general conclusions upon the subject we have seen that there is no distinct server class in japan and that a person's social status is not altered by the fact that he serves in a menial capacity provided that service be of one above him in rank and not below him this is largely the result of the grading of society upon other lines than those on which our social distinctions are founded and partly the result of the fact that women of whatever class are servants so far as persons of the opposite sex in their own class are concerned the women of japan to-day form the great servile class and as they are also wives and mothers of those whom they serve they are treated of course with a certain consideration and respect never given to a mere servant and through them all domestic service is elevated there are two employments which i have mentioned among those of domestic servants because they would be so classed by us but which in japan rank among the trades the chinrikisha men and the groom belong as a rule to a certain class at the bottom of the social ladder and no samurai would think of entering either of these occupations except under stress of severest poverty the bettos or grooms are a hereditary class and a regular guild and have a reputation among both japanese and foreigners as a betting gambling cheating good-for-nothing lot an honest betto is a rare phenomenon the chinriksha men are many of them sons of peasants who come to the cities for the sake of earning more money or leading a livelier life than can be found in the little thatched cottage among the rice fields few of them are married or have homes of their own many of them drink and gamble and so the wild oats in all possible ways but they are all well-meaning fairly honest happy-go-lucky set who lead hard lives of exhausting labour and endure long hours of exposure to heat and cold rain snow and blinding sunshine not only with little complaint or crumbling but with absolute cheerfulness and hilarity a strong fast chinriksha man takes great pride in his strength and speed it is a point of honour with him to pull his passenger up the steepest and most slippery of hills and never to heed him if he expresses a desire to walk in order to save his man i have had my kurumaya stoutly refuse again and again my offers to walk up a steep hill even when the snow was so soft and slippery under his bare feet that he fell three times in making the ascent daijobu safe would be his smiling response to all my protestations and once in a chinriksha the passenger is entirely at the mercy of his man in all matters of getting into and out of the vehicle but though the chinriksha man is for the time being the autocrat and controlling power over his passenger and though he will not obey the behests of his employer except so far as they seem reasonable and in accordance with the best interests of all concerned he constitutes himself the protector and assistant the advice and counsellor of him whom he serves and gives his best thought and intelligence as well as his speed and strength to the service in which he is engaged if he thinks it safe he will tear like an unbroken call through the business portions of the city knocking bundles out of the hands of food passengers or even hitting the wayfarers themselves in a fierce dash through their midst laughing gaily at their protests and at threats of wrath to come from his helpless passenger 
but should hint of insult or injury against kuruma passenger or passenger's dog fall upon his ears he will drop the jinrikshaw shafts and administer condign punishment to the offender unchecked by thoughts of the ever-present police or by any terrors that his employer may hold over his head in no other country in the world perhaps can a lady place more and higher confidence in the honour and loyalty of her servant than she can in japan in her kurumaya whether he be her private servant or one from a respectable stand he may not do what she bids him but that is quite a secondary matter he will study her interests will remember her likes and dislikes will take a mental inventory of the various accessories or bundles that she carries with her and will never permit her to lose or forget one of them will run his legs off in the service and defend her and her property valiantly in case of need of course as in all classes there are different grades so there are jinrikshaw -sure men who seem to have sunk so low in their calling that they have lost all feeling of loyalty to their employer and only care selfishly for the pittance they gain such men are often found in the treaty ports eagerly seeking for the rich foreigner from whom they can get an extra fee and whom they regard as outside of their code of morals and hence as their natural prey travellers and even residents of japan have often complained of such treatment and it is only after long stay in japan among the japanese themselves that one can tell what a jinrikshaw man is capable of if you employ one kurumaya for any length of time you come to have a real affection for him on account of his loyal faithful cheerful service such as we seldom find in this country except when inspired by personal feeling when you have ridden miles and miles by night and by day through rain and sleet and hottest sunshine behind a man who has used every power of body and mind in your service you cannot but have strong feeling of affection toward him and of pride in him as well it is something the feeling that one has for a good saddle horse but more developed you rejoice not only in his strength and speed put forth so willingly in your service in his picturesque dark blue costume with your monochrome embroidered on the back in his handsomely turned ankles in his black wavy hair in his delicate hands and trim waist though these are often a source of pride to you but his skill in divining your wants his use of his tongue in your service his helping out of your faltering japanese with explanations which if not elegant have the merit of being easily understood his combats with extortionate shopkeepers in your behalf his interest in all your doings and concerns remain as a pleasant memory upon your return to a land where no man would so far forget his manhood as to give himself so completely and without reserve to the service of any master save mammon as old japan with its quaintness its medieval flavour its feudalism its loyalty its sense of honour and its transcendental contempt for money and luxury recedes into the past and as the memories of my life there grow dim two figures stand out more and more boldly from the fading background both the figures of faithful servants one yasaku the kurumaya a very hercules who could keep close to a pair of coach horses through miles of city streets and who never suffered mortal jinrikshaw men to pass him my champion in all times of danger and alarm but a very autocrat in all minor matters his cheery face his broad shoulders with their blue draperies his jolly boyish voice and his dainty delicate hands come before me as i write and i wonder to what fortunate person he is now giving the intelligent service that he once gave so wholeheartedly to me the other okayo my maid her plain little face with its upturned eyes growing as the days went by absolutely beautiful in the light of pure goodness that beamed from it a japanese christian with all the christian virtues well developed she became to me not only a good servant doing her work with conscientious fidelity but a sympathetic friend to whom i turned for help in time of need and whom i left when i returned to america with a sincere sorrow in my heart at parting with one who had grown to fill so large a place in my thoughts her little half shy half motherly ways toward her big foreign mistress had a charm all their own her pride and delight over my progress in language her patient efforts to make me understand new words or to understand my uncouth foreign idioms her joy when at last i reached a point where a story told by her lips could be comprehended and enjoyed gave a continual encouragement in a task too often completely disheartening during the last summer of my stay in japan cutting loose from all foreigners and foreign associations i travelled alone with her through the heart of the country stopping only at japanese hotels and carrying with me no supplies to eke out the simple japanese fare through flats and typhoons we journeyed long days of scorching heat or driving rain in no way abated her cheerfulness or lessened her desire to do all that she could for my aid and comfort not one sad look nor impatient word showed a flaw in her perfect temper 
and if she privately made up her mind that i was crazy she never by word or look gave a hint of her thought chin rickshaw men crumbled and gave out hotel keepers resented the presence of my dog or presented extortionate bills but okayo's good temper and tact never failed her difficulties were smoothed away bills were compromised and reduced the dog slept securely by my side on a red blanket in the best rooms of the best hotels and okayo smiled told her quaint stories amused me and ministered to me as if i were her own object in life though her husband and children were far away in distant tokyo and her mother's heart yearned for her little ones End of domestic service recording by Yulin Demeyer.